Hi, how's it going? This is Resident of Collinwood for YouTube. I'm here to continue my read alone of the Dark Shadows Daybook Unbound, written by Patrick McCray. Episode 1049. When a drunken Carolyn announces that she knows the deadly secret of Collinwood, will she live to tell it? Carolyn Loomis, Nancy Barrett. Carolyn, thinking she knows the secret of Angelique and Alexis, gleefully taunts everyone at Collinwood. Unfortunately, the killer lures her away and stabs her in retribution. As a showrunner, Dan Curtis was too far ahead of his time. The parallel time sequence of the show is an experiment in and testament to that, as is the project he had running. Yes, parallel the film House of Dark Shadows. An episode like this allows him to test waters and flex muscles that we can see later in his career as a bloodthirsty and unsentimental filmmaker. He sets up the, cl the clitches of the soap opera and then shows his frustration by smashing them with an unceremonious sense of ritual and if he didn't the writers reading the room did it for him even though i've summarized that or sorry i've summarized the episode twice let me make my my own go at it neither doing a TV guide, nor a vaguely quintentive recap, quintessentive recap, sorry. Carolyn, in a maezima of booze, bitchiness, <laughs> and low self-esteem, plays in formational keep-away without realizing the actual consequences that follow. As a result, the <clears throat> sorry, she gets stabbed to death by the one character bitchier and lower self esteemier than she, Roger. Dark Shadows has had enough of that nonsense and starts playing for keeps, a practice that it will follow throughout the final sequence of the series. If you screw up, or even if you keep company with screw ups, you'll die. In today's world of ruthless real television series, killing off central characters is an event that's no longer shocking. Dan Curtis inarguably invented it. So all you other guys, get back in line. Across town, Curtis is preparing, although we rarely acknowledge it as such, it's the second parallel time storyline that he would present, each one getting uglier and more nil nihilistic, each one more relentlessly transparent in the logic of what it plays out. In 1970 parallel time, we see a Carolyn who is also widowed, paranoid, and unstable, just like in real life. In her dialogue with a heartbroken Liz, it's not so much a glimpse into a parallel universe as it is into a future that Dark Shadows never quite reached. She's both explosively abusive toward those with failed love and implosive as a reaction to the one she's lost completely. Unlike the world of standard TV of the era, there's only so long that that can go, and the show finally exploits that ugly truth. Similar on the big screen, Curtis will take it a step further. I'm no expert on things that don't exist, which is why I'm not a theologian, <laughs> but I can guess that an emotionally shattered 
hemophic man who profited from the dehumanization slave trade and starved for two centuries will probably dine without sentiment or remorse when released on an unsuspecting world by an incompetent redneck and someone will eventually take him out once he plays out all of his cards by becoming the most prodigious and swiftest serial killer in the history of Maine. Because that's Barnabas 2.0. This reflects Dan Curtis himself. Uncle Barnabas, the hero, is a concession to TV. Barnabas, the killer, is probably more like the truth. When the writers asked Dan where the TV version was, and he responded that he wasn't doing it that way again, we get the most revealing statement about the creator possible. <laughs> Yeah. This is the producer who would send writers running from meetings, throwing up, and parallel time. This kind of blunt pain, short timer, unsentimental parallel time, as we have in in this episode. This, or sorry, this episode is not necessarily so parallel. It's unfortunately true. The secret to Dark Shadows is not that we've gone to parallel time, but that we finally emerged from it. This episode hit the airwaves July 2nd, 1970. 1970, Ragnarok Redux, baby, yeah! Night has fallen over the great house of Collinwood. This is probably my favorite storyline in this series. Although it's also the least fun having done having gone to 1995 in a sideways attempt to escape parallel time. Barnabas finds Collawood in ruins and stumbles across a list of events that will precede its doom. He returns to the present, whatever that means, at this point, and despite his valiant handwritten Collinwood is destroyed. Well, we can all stop bitching and moaning about the show being about a pen. It's proof that Dan Curtis was capable of epic storytelling without even leaving his minute studio. <laughs> miniature studio. <laughs> no, it's not about a pen. It's not even about dark shadows. It's about America. It's about a man from the era of America's highest aspirations thrust into chaos and devastation. Is it the result of his absence or the logical consequences of his actions? That's a sphinx without a riddle. But this is not the program that began in 1966. When we could and would climb out of Camelot's crater, carried on the shoulders of a mighty Texan in Washington and in his care soar ever upward to the moon and beyond. Or so we thought. The mud of Woodstock mirrored us in the belief that this was the best it could get. We buried another Kennedy and a king and an ex. Charlie had done the devil's work Indeed, and his legacy is written in the soul's blood of pure erotic ebullience. <clears throat> Sharon Tate needs security? Question mark. Call the Hell's Angels. We see how ultimate worked out. I'm sure chronic kite. Cronkite talked about it after disclosing the Vietnam death toll for the day. So Barnabas goes 25 years beyond all of that and finds Collinwood in ruins. I am not surprised. The town of Collinsport is terrified to even speak the name Collins. Perhaps because they destroyed them. Perhaps because they did not save them. Barnabas returns with a list of events that will signal the fall 
he thinks that he can avert them, but our poor, poor Polisimulo is reliably mistaken. <laughs> yeah, he is too. The list is inevitable. He is not a savior. He's the herald of Galactus. It is a list designed to mock his aspirations. And expecting him to change the events enumerated on it is like asking Patrick Henry to come to our time and prevent the domestic terrorism of January 6. And after the events of that, Day in 2021, the darkest day in American history. We should not watch this storyline the same way ever. Art challenges the status quo by asking us to see the familiar through new eyes. This show will do that before becoming affirmation once again. It is a painful prophecy that unfolds with the helpless dissolution of of oncology results. It's made more watchable when you realize that we will resolve itself, it, or sorry, it will resolve itself happily. Barnabas will go to 1840 and by trusting the most important woman in his life will be there when he, she rescues the future. How is that affirmable? Or sorry, or affirmational? By example, we are in the 1840 of some future generation's potential dystopia. Change is up to us, but before the dawn, we need a little more darkness. Very, very nice. I love the uh, Galactus reference in this too. <laughs> very, very nice. Episode 1083. Sebastian Shaw, one of my favorite characters, uh, in going from 1995. Now, he's not in the 1995 arc, but when they get back to 1970, we meet a character named Sebastian Shaw, um, who's played by Christopher Pino. Sebastian Shaw disturbs Haley with news from the beyond, but will he open his third eye in time to see that Collins Port's most Vulnerable hunk is becoming is coming his way. Professor Stokes, Fair David. David and Hallie find a dollhouse of Rose Cottage in the playroom. In the playroom and are disturbed by the presence of dolls that resemble themselves. Driven by Haley's evasions. Professor Stokes visits Sebastian. Although he implies that Sebastian is a fraud, Sebastian demonstrates his powers through a heartfelt vision that ends in the sight of the children sleeping. After Stokes leaves, Sebastian confides in Roxanne that the children were actually dead. At Collinwood, David and Haley try to break Gerard's spell by burning the dolls. When they return to the playroom, the dolls have reappeared unharmed. The irony of Dark Shadows broadcast history is that by the time they were making the episodes that would have regularly given kids nightmares, the kids for whom the show was vaguely aimed were too old to be scared or given nightmares by soap operas or maybe still watching but 1,083 is a fine candidate for nightmare inducement and a perfectly good reason to walk a little slower on the way home from school. Lately, Jonathan Fred and Grayson Hall are not reliably waiting to greet them. It's a cursed storyline, cursed by the fact that we already know their doom. Yes, the whole point is averting it, but at no point do our heroes catch a glimmer of hope. In this episode, we have only the third stringers to rely upon, and I hate to call Professor Stokes this, but the role of skeptic is a strange one for him. 
and it's a little odd to try and get behind <clears throat> him not believing in something, especially because he gets it wrong, and that's what they do in the Ragnarok sequence. They get it wrong at every critical point when getting it right, right with Thwart Gerard. He is a villain whose plan only works because of in entropy and all star can only get it right so many times stokes not only has trouble detecting that sebastian shaw is the real deal but he even fails to detect the only lie told by him that the children were in no real danger in fact he saw them dead this isn't a testament to stokes waning powers it's a tribute to the insurmountable odds he faces in near ignorance. Killing kids is one of the one of horror's few taboos, reserved only when the medium has no interest in charming the audience. And to witness what happens when you effectively break that taboo, revisit Pet Cemetery. Sure kids have died, almost died before on the show but never just, because heroes constantly outmatched. One of the only things that makes much horror watchable is the knowledge that the forces of good may somehow escape, or as with the 1982 The Thing, at least take it with them on the way down. The last victory Gerard once is a moral one, and it's clear that none will happen on his watch. 1083 typifies the storyline in that David and Halley are on the front lines of both the attack and the defense. Fewer things are more unsettling than trying to solve a problem you may be unwillingly, you may have be unwillingly creating the episode like and episodes like these are strange precursors to the feeling that Candyman gave audiences. There too, the hero, the heroine, is a lightning rod for manipulation by the villain. Dollhouses, ha, as I've noted before, are testaments to our desire to control. As David and Halle try to sidestep its rules by burning the dollhouse. Gerard must again deliver a memo, and inevitably by making them reappear. Why a dollhouse? Coming up on a future episode, David and Hallie will see themselves replacing the fig figure figures figures within. It's what I consider to be the single most disturbing image on the show. Gerard's message is a clear one. David and Halley are already dolls in the dollhouse themselves. Collower Gerard is its clear master, and maybe he has been for a very, very long time. This episode hit the airwaves August 19, 1970. Episode 1092. Julia's plan to put Maggie into intentional danger results in Maggie being put into intentional danger. Maggie, Catherine Lee Scott. Julia uses Maggie as bait to find her attacker, but the plan fails as she and Barnabas continue to decode prophecy and study Rose Cottage, the children are drawn to the playroom. By Carrie's taunting voice, there they see themselves as dolls in the dollhouse. 1970 is Collinwood, but not Collinwood. When Barnabas and Julia return from parallel time in 1995, Roger and Liz are gone, as are any outsiders who are not menacing weirdos like Roxanne and Sebastian. I don't know how much I would miss Sam and Burke at the Blue Whale, which is the drawing room for the common man. <clears throat> 
1970 is Collinwood, but not Collinwood. When Barnabas and Julia returned from parallel time in 1995, Roger and Liz are gone, as are any outsiders who are not menacing weirdos like Roxanne and Sebastian. I don't know how much I would miss Sam and Burke and the Blue Whale, which is the drawing room for the common man, quite so much. The stories have been so exotic that we really haven't had time to mourn them. But the bread and butter of so much of the show was playing off rich from not rich, isolated from urban, sherry from straws, etc. This perhaps became irrelevant with the introduction of Quentin, a man of pretty common sensibilities within a aristocratic last name aristocratic sorry last name losing that chemistry is a shame because it grounded the show in the family take that away and disorientation sets in never before has the Collins family felt more isolated and helpless are these things even going on don't bother to look the mirror was blind blinded a year ago. The Collins always saw themselves as the saviors of the commoners, but it's the other way around. The last of the townsfolk, Maggie, is finally being sacrificed. It's the price she pays for climbing Mount Olympus. She was she was right to warn Vicky and a chump for ignoring her own life. <laughs> Oh, that was good. That was good. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, my God. That was gold, dude. Oh, God, dude. 1,092. And he's right, too. That's, that's the funny part about it. Begins with Maggie being allowed to wander the Collins' estate so that Julia can track her, track down her assailant. When that fails, she and Barnabas refuse to alert the authorities, which might have been a life-saving move. It's as if they had the series want, want her to die. Maggie has been astro astonishingly indestructible, and it takes a team effort of malice, hunger, and negligent friends to finally pour her into Sebastian's car. <laughs> but with sensible average folk around, there is no way that the Collinses would have stayed in that house. I mean, it's Quentin, the kids, Barnabas, and Julia. Carolyn, too. That's a double room at the Collins poured in and a couple of sleeping bags. It might be close quarters, but Gerard can have the, the house. Doesn't happen in a vacuum of prag, pra, pra, pragmatism. There is what we're left with, and it's intentional. Horror may be the ultimate expression of art, because both are about sh stripping down the essentials until the only remaining choice exists by default. The children fight inevitably, inevitability and are victimized by it all at the same time that they symbolically enact it. Kathy Cody's best acting on the show is her eerie voice as the gloating voice of Karen. Another element that makes this Collarwood not Collarwood begins with David Hennessy's narration. It's not supposed to be it's he's not supposed to be doing this and his voice is not supposed to be that deep. He and Howie even argue over whether or not she's a guest. And David gives her the bad news that she's becoming a lifer. So is that the next Vicky or Carolyn? Yes, no, too young. All answers apply, ultimately making her another element that doesn't quite fit. 
and doesn't quite fit on purpose. It keeps Carla with alien to us because this upcoming trip is not about saving David or Carlwood. Whether he knows it or not, this trip will ultimately be about Barnabas saving himself. Barnabas continues to wander through a liminal forest and in the woods of Michael in the words of Michael Corleone, every time he thinks he's out, they pull him back in. 1897 seemed to be the forest, and 1970 home, it was a specific place to which he could return after parallel time. But nothing's the same when he does. The household is different. Even Julia's hair is different. The forest has followed him into a present that may be more unfamiliar than parallel time. By the time he returns home to 1971, Collawood is finally the familiar saint, but he is not that's the irony, and it's not a nice one. Is he being manipulated? We are all viewers, and our sympathies. Heroes and their supposed true love. 1092 is talking about this in loud silences, and a final image both chilling and satirical when we realize we are in the dollhouse with them. This episode hit the airwaves September 1st, 1970, episode 1105. When Barnabas realizes that Maggie is bonded to another vampire, it's time for Willie to raise the stakes before she's gone for good. Willie John Carlin. Julia and Barnabas are again unable to protect Maggie from the other vampire, and thanks to Carolyn's mocking help, Willie finally finds her in the mausoleum, attacked again. They later track down the vampire's daytime resting place, and he and Julia are shocked at what they find. Unthinkable and existential crimes and affronts to Collinwood if it existed, but does it? A Collinwood without Lewis Edmonds or Joan Bennett is not exactly Collinwood. But has anyone noticed? It just kind of happens. The series lulls us into a presumptuous nonchalance, and when we finally call roll, it's far too late. 1105 brings us into the last five episodes of the prime and contemporary universe in which the series began. It was and is home, and excluding a brief glimpse in, in 1198, this represents the beginning of our last and most apocalyptic visit. There is no sweet to the bitter, and if you're looking for sentiment or nostalgia, look elsewhere. It's not a home, it's a house. Roger and Liz are gone, and we are a far cry from Roger's declaration to an early ghost that we'll be back. Quentin comes and goes primarily to betray everyone for a fellow former Phantom out of time. Barnabas is compromised to strictly nocturnal operations. All three residents, Carolyn, David, and Hallie, are on the road to demonic corruption. With David and Hallie missing, what does that leave? Mackie. At last, even she lacks the wherewithal to defy the vampire summons. If death doesn't claim her before undeath can, a surrogate guardian for the home, she's unable to guard even herself. I haven't seen Mrs. Do Mrs. Johnson conscious lately. Willie, of course, is Willie. Stokes is busy fulfilling a prophecy that said he'd be nowhere near the joint when the chips were due. 
That leaves Julia as the last and only guardian of the house. And what remains of the family? How did she get this assignment? And why should she be stuck with KP when there is not a single sane, uncorrupted person in the house? <coughs> oh, excuse me. When she escapes to 1840, it's not just to save her own life, it's an escape to life, any life. It's such a strange and terminal predicament for the ensemble of both actors and characters that makes Gerard's curse feel real. He's been destroying the house for months. It's only now stepping back that we actually notice how successful he's been. His work is done. The zombies are merely a flourish. This is a tough, sad, abstinent storyline, and it defies efforts to love it. Gothic literature knits a strange glamour into its sense of decay, but the Ragnarok sequence doesn't. It's a very real death, and it doesn't even feel reversible. With the mechanics the show has established, it just quietly malignant and its mirthlessly mocks our heroes. Barnabas loses Maggie to vampirism, which is bad enough, but it's not even his vampirism. He can't find or summon the other vampire or even guess its gender. Willie is equally incapable of protecting Maggie, finding her near where he intentionally found Barnabas years before. Quentin seduced by one ghost and about to be assassinated by another, taunted as a villain he never was from a timeline he never knew. But we did. As Willie is charged with killing the vampire at the end, we realize how unlikely this is, and that is just a solve, like Iraq after 9-11. It's not even the primary problem. When the vampire slowly murdering Maggie Evans is more is a mere distraction from the real crisis facing Hollywood. Are you dealing with a hell of a you are dealing with a hell of a crisis? But what's the real crisis? Because Gerard is the easiest answer, and that elusiveness is both the sequence's strength and vulnerability. This episode hit the airwaves. September 18th, 1970. Very, very well read, said by Patrick. Uh, read by Patrick here. Um, for those who've never watched Shark Shadows, I'm going to explain what he's sort of getting across to you guys. You know, I've talked about how 1995 is the beginning of the Judas after arc. Um, when Barnabas and Julia come back from 1995, they warned everybody what's going to happen. Um, but as Patrick uh, said in his book here, all their warnings are, are for naught. I mean, everything blows up in their face. I mean, everything they try, nothing works. And what you're ultimately really seeing in 1970, Patrick put it right here in his book too, is you're slowly seeing the very destruction you saw, and you're going to see how it happens. And it happens just as it said, but so criminally good how it gets done. And it's something you really got to appreciate by the writers here and how big of a chance Dan and the writers are taking here by doing this. I mean, this, is a, this isn't just a gut punch. This is a gut punch and a knee to the face while you're down. And and you just want to stand up and say, give me more. Because <laughs> it's so fucking good. <laughs> it really is. Um, to watch the zombies, to watch Gerard Styles wave the flag, that's, that's the moment where you're going, oh crap, because that's, the waving of the flag, it's not the waving of the flag that's the ultimate smack in the face. It's the murder of the kids. 
And then the waving of, of the flag is the icing on the cake, if you will, for me, in my opinion. I just want to say that. Um, I'll have to ask Patrick about this when I bring him back on Sunday. Because um, I love this here. Really, really good. Episode 1106. When Julia and Willie open what might be the box for Barnabas' real doll, they discover the real truth, which may be a real pain in the neck. Roxanne, Drew, Roxanne Donna, what, Wendry, Wendry? Julia and Willie discover Roxanne's coffin. Barnabas' love for her prevents them from killing her. Barnabas traps her in the old house. Pursued by Sebastian, who later opens her coffin and aims a gun inside, the show has seven months left. A widely successful storyline in 1897 was followed up by three storylines that command unfavorable comparison. A movie has been released depicting most of the characters getting killed. They are no longer just cultural giants with symbolic weight. They are simply characters, not icons. No matter how much the public adores them, they are just storytelling pawns for the producers. The show is still successful. It could be argued, though, that it has released just enough grasp on its identity that we can suddenly contemplate the word without it. It's too late in the series for this, and because of that, it's all about the more welcome. Here we are in the midst of a of this dark shadow when what should break out dark shadows. It was a year ago when the show outgrew its habit habitat like almost any living thing. It had to. After insurmountable evolutions and explorations, exploration, sorry, the show found its apotheosis in 1897. And after exploring the wildest potentials of Cold War Gothic storytelling for four years in three different eras, few possibilities seem left in the genre. Besides, they had become their own genre. After four years and a very successful summer, of learning to break the rules, they were now in a position to make the rules. So, why not cure Barnabas? Is there anything really left? And if you're going to cure Barnabas, you might as well give Quentin a happy ending also. Even though he's only been around for a bit, it seems like he's earned it. Besides, have we really had a leading man who wasn't also trying to kill Roger or kidnap Maggie or constantly avoid Willie's and Corey's about why he has yet to make employee of the month. <laughs> yeah. He is in fact the only employee. <laughs> so for the prior year, more or less, the show has been basking in its own glow. Yes, let's have some Paul Stoddard heck we can bring Paul Stoddard in and then turn around and kill him. Why not have a snake cult? It gives things a touch of super spy panache. Heck, let's make a movie and send the rest of the cast into a parallel dimension. Let Thera David have that pencil-thin mustache he's always pining for. <laughs> Very vaguely on the launching pad of Desperate, and it is now so confident and ambitious that we care towards the apocalypse by default. Because what's what's left, really? If the show were a growing person, it has reached the dark and mordant introspection of early middle-aged. 
middle age, sorry. <clears throat> Gerard sits in the center of a postmodern existential vibrant labyrinth, mocking the enlightenment and industrial resolution heroes with rumors of inevitable doom. It refuses to disclose its weapons, much less its terms of surrender. Why should it? It needs no weapons. There are no terms of surrender because there will be no surrender, only complete annihilation. Gloomy stuff? Compelling, but gloomy. Profound thinking usually goes there with enough self ex self actualization self actualization after all death and cancellation come for us all even the undead the show was drawn from some of the finest works of literature if literature eventually follows the bleak but contemporary highway of modernism so must dark shadows and we've been trained to accept it over the past year and define dark shadows by this woeful Welchian. So there is, he is, sulking around Rose Cottage with its Welchian hanging out. And then along comes an all-star tribute to dark shadows by dark shadows, almost as if the writers were nostalgic for their salad days when the biggest concerns revolved around life's simple pleasures like a chain coffin containing one of your loved ones. You know, that special someone who may be up for a steak through the heart or a lifetime of starving imprisonment with the symbol of a dispassionate god burning a hole through their chest or maybe just a big warm hug. It's that kind of episode, beginning in a crypt with a stake-wielding vampire, with stake-wielding vampire hunters. It remains faithful to the only set that may matter: the old house, drawing room, and with Captain Matthew Morgan, Rubbermaid, Big Max, Love Dugan behind the bookcase, and another suitable Gothic setting where Roxanne's coffin has been waiting for his moment. Or, sorry, Max Love Dungeon. Um, and, of course, being Dark Shadows, that moment ends up being intentional, unintentional, righteous. Roxanne has been a vampire since 1840. So, for 130 years, which is far longer than Barnabas has been a vampire, Taking into account elapsed time and all, Barnabas has only been a vampire for two or three years. You would think that she would have figured out some place more secure to keep to sleep it off. Julie and Willie might know one end of the stake from another, but they are not exactly this, the team that you call in to test an and a penetrable security system. I doubt they could cut line at the stake in all salad bar. It's hard to tell how many times Roxanne almost dies in this episode. Her coffin is open constantly, and when it's not open, there's somebody going in just to stand by it and think about opening it. For the same thing, but the same thing happened to Barnabas. When Potofi had him as a prisoner, captures were constantly opening it up, taking the cross off, letting them stretch, putting the cross back on, closing the lid, and repeating the process all over again. No wonder Barnabas had to sleep in a coffin. He was exhausted. That wasn't Dictated by the rules of the supernatural, it was a political statement to his captors. <laughs> if this is a full and possible active characters, or sorry, if this is full of impo impossibly active characters who never quite appear, 
We've already talked about how exhausted Roxanne must be. But they really exhausted and insulted character has to be Quentin. And Julia, met, and Julia comes up with her big scheme to calm Barnabas by confronting him with absolute emotional chaos. She realizes that Willie isn't up for the job of curating and decorator and decorator. So, completely off stage, she sends for Quentin to help move the coffin. I'm sure he's thrilled at this point. Quentin has so little to do that he's reduced to sleeping wildly heavy crates off stage. We assume it's by hand because it. I don't think Quentin is the station wagon type in that moment. It's a teachable moment. Check with Julia before giving Liz the keys to the forklift for some big date. But amidst all of the nostalgia and silliness and morbid merriment, the old school nature of, <coughs> of the episode also serves an important purpose for the plot to come. Even though... This is a new world of gods and monsters, so unlike the one just a year prior, it is still inhabited by the heroes who were shaped by the early age. And where does it all eventually go? Barnabas loses Angelique after discovering the unallowed nature of his love. So everything from there back to here is a setup for that moment in the startling fit of Nature, maturity Barnabas uses that he truly is beyond Josette. Why Josette was just the most proximate cure to the underlining problem. Loneliness, if the show is about Barnabas, which is, which, let's not kid ourselves, it is, then his primary concern is the primary concern of the show. It's the most inconvenient of primary concerns it's not the one it's the one it's one that no one wants to hear about again loneliness i think this is what drives barnabas it resists thoughtfully under the veneer of the pursuit of josette and it tenders stretch across the storylines the show begins with Elizabeth, whose loneliness is self-imposed. Send for an orphan to tutor a motherless child who, for all we know, has been making his own Braunschweiger sandwiches for breakfast since he was four. The entire program deals with the lonely hangover of the fellowship party that ended a decade or two before the show even began. Stake or seduce Barnabas. This indecision he faces is emblematic of the entire program. Is Roxanne the ultimate companion, or is she the opportunity for ultimate redemption? Is she the only one who can truly understand the pain of his existence? Is she just close enough to seem familiar, or... Does her ruthlessness demand elimination? Barnabas is paralyzed by these considerations, and it's an important opportunity to just pause for a moment. It's only the smartest, grand decision of his life. Or sorry, smallest, grand decision of his life. This episode was broadcast September 21st, 1970. Okay, let's see. All right, guys, I'm going to stop there because that is the end of chapter five, and I'll be starting chapter six when I come back. Um, really, really good. I'm enjoying this very much. Um, I'm going to be starting 1840, uh, Masters of Both Worlds. So that'll be chapter six I'll be starting. This was the end of uh, chapter five, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I enjoyed reading this very, very much. Um, very, very great job by Patrick. Um, I really enjoyed, really enjoyed the parallel time stuff. Um, 
guys, if you have not picked up the Dark Shadows Daybook Unbound yet, please do. It is really, really a great read. And I'm really enjoying this. And I think you guys will too. Um, link to where you can get it is in the description box. You guys have a great day.